All right, so this is going to be a super rapid fire review for Unit 5B on interest groups, political parties, and the media. Uh, and it's going to be super rapid fire because I did uh, basically cover each one of these flashcards when we did our Canvas Studio videos in uh, what is uh, bound to be more detail than what I'm about to cover now. So this is just really quick. So make sure you've gone back to those Canvas Studio videos. First of all, flashcard one, linkage institution. A linkage institution is something that connects voters and uh, citizens uh, to the government, connects the government to um, other parts uh, uh, of the government, and uh, basically ties things together, links things together. So political parties are a linkage institution. Um, they link different parts of the government together. They link um, you know, state and local governments to the national government. They link voters to, um, you know, people, voters register with a political party. Elections are a linkage institution. The media is a linkage institution. Interest groups are linkage institutions. So things that link voters to the government or parts of the government to other parts. That's uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about linkage institutions. And they do this in different ways. So... You know, I just talked about, uh, you know, certainly parties, interest groups, flashcard two, you know, certainly people can participate in interest groups, um, you know, through funding or activism. Certainly uh, also interest groups can get involved in the, the lawmaking process. They can be kind of linking different parts of government together that way. Elections, obviously, you know, people vote in elections. They're co connected to government there. And then media, you know, uh, certainly politicians and, and government uh, policymakers will certainly find ways to get onto media. Uh, people will consume media and will connect them to those policymakers. And you know, certainly we have a big debate over how objective media is and what the quality of media sources is. But uh, that's something that's um, you know certainly uh, at, at the core of how people are linked together, how government uh, links to voters. Now, when we talk uh, specifically about uh, political parties, they do a lot of different things. We've talked about this. So they mobilize, they educate voters. Certainly, parties have their own platforms to do this. They come up with a platform at their national convention. They publish this. It lays out their principles. And certainly, that impacts the agenda of policymakers. So if we're talking about how it impacts government, it impacts their relationship with the electorate. People find parties appealing. Parties recruit candidates. You uh, certainly would uh, be uh, having a, a leg up if you have the backing of a party when you decide to go and try to win that party's nomination. And parties can try to recruit people who are active in local politics and try to bring them into state-level politics or national-level politics. Parties will often have a fundraising arm, and they can help coordinate uh, events, uh, help distribute resources. They can figure out where to allocate media dollars spent what messages they want to uh, send in different districts and races around the country. And certainly parties have different leaders in each state. It's a big country. Parties are large organizations, especially if we're talking about the Democratic and the Republican Party. Uh, that being said, parties have less control as, uh, as it comes to selecting print, uh, candidates and determining uh, strategy and figuring out what uh, campaigns are going to look like than they used to because we now have more candidate-centered campaigns and individuals' personalities become much more at the core of how they message themselves and people are more inclined to uh, you know, kind of focus in on, on who the candidate is and, and how they're connecting with voters than they are uh, the party itself. So, you know, certainly Trump is someone who took the Republican Party by storm and it became much more about him than it became about what the party had stood for in the past. And then the party has kind of morphed and changed to, to focus on him personally. Um, of course, he's lost the election, and now uh, moving forward, party has to decide. You know what? What is their identity now that Trump is no longer the president? Um, so, uh, describing the role of parties has changed and weakened when it comes to choosing candidates for office. I mean, I basically talked about that. There, they're you know they're becoming uh, much more uh, uh, candidate centered. Number one and two, uh, the parties now have also um, talking about our our last unit. They've now made this more of a democratic process for choosing candidates for office, especially in the, the primaries, the Republican and the Democratic primaries. It used to be that the party elites would choose party nominees for a president. Now the voters do in primaries and caucuses. So, you know, that's something that the party has kind of given up some control um, over their pro over their uh, their their process of selecting candidates. Now, uh, over time. You know, parties gradually shift their views. That's because the country 
changes. That's because the, the voters change. The issues that the nation is facing changes. Parties win elections. Party lose, parties lose elections. They re, re-strategize there. And so, you know, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party in particular, they've come to mean very different things. You know, the Republican Party started as an anti-slavery or at least opposed to the expansion of slavery party. Clearly, that's not part of their platform any, anymore. We don't have slavery anymore. Um, you know, and it used to be that the Democratic Party was stronger in the South and the Republican Party was stronger in the North. That's not the case. Over time, issues evolve. Coalitions of voters that are getting different uh, support from uh, different parties and different issues that they're standing for, they'll start to support different different party structures. And uh, when we have moments, in flashcard seven, where these shifts happen in a significant way, we call those moments critical elections. And a critical election is one that signals that there has been some sort of realignment. Um, you know, regionally, in particular, we see can, we can see realignments where occur where different parts of the country are supporting different parties. Uh, sometimes it's a very slow process, and sometimes we have elections that indicate that there's been a significant transformation. The election of 1860 being, you know, perhaps the most obvious example of that. Um, a critical re-election where the, the, the coalition of who's supporting that party and where that support's coming from uh, has ch- undergone a rapid change. Um, campaign finance law has certainly impacted parties. Parties through the McCain-Feingold bill, which was passed in 2002, they're not as able to funnel um, an unlimited amounts of quote-unquote soft money, unregulated money, into political campaigns. So that's been a restriction on them. Instead, now we have these super PACs, which are kind of, you know, doing this outside this enormous campaign uh, financing outside of those traditional party structures. So, you know, the party doesn't have as much control over, um, you know, the amount of money that can be funneled into campaigns. That's more about now business and different groups and, and organizations that are kind of getting involved in that process. Flashcard 9 says, what impact have changes in communication and data management technology had on parties? And this is a definitely an ongoing uh, concept, but you know now we have parties that are going to have uh, enormous amounts of data at their fingertips when it comes to uh, where do voters live, um, uh, who, have they, who have they registered with, in, in the past, you know, what changes are occurring, uh, what, and then of course we have social media data and, you know, where can they access that data and are there third parties, um, that a third, by, by third parties, I don't mean political parties, but, but uh, you know, independent businesses and organizations that are, are harvesting data and then selling that to political parties or, or um, you know, political entities and campaigns, you know, that's certainly something that is, is dramatically changing what they do. Um, and they're having, they're having to focus on, you could argue it's democratization, right? Because they're now trying to hone in on individual voters rather than elites. Uh, but you could also argue that, um, you know, having this sort of data uh, is, is allowing them to focus on, you know, their core constituencies only and not focus on a broader appeal, which you could argue is contributing to uh, continued division and polarization in this country. Now, moving on to flashcard 10, third parties, one of the things we're talking about. Third parties are, you know, they're, they're, they're impactful, uh, which is what flashcard uh, 11 talks about, but also they're restricted by our processes. So winner take all voting, both in the electoral college and in um, individual congressional races, it's really a winner take all system. If you win a state in the electoral college, with the exception of Maine and Nebraska, then you win all the electoral votes. So third parties, you know, they have to win these races in order to get any support. If they get 20% of support in a state in the presidential race, they get no uh, power. They get no influence in choosing the executive. And the same goes for the single member districts in Congress, the winner take all races, where third parties may get 10, 15, 20% of the votes in races all across the country potentially, uh, and they would get no seats in Congress. So our system is not a proportional system, which happens in other countries, where if a third party gets 15% of the votes, they would get 15% of the seats. That means third parties are very much limited by the system we have in the United States. And you know, a lot of people criticize this and other people say it's just fine, but that's the reality. They're not able to really break through into that top tier. And because of it, they get no power. It's not that they get less power, they get no power. However, some would argue, flashcard 11, that they do have some role 
in uh, contributing to the changing of the party platforms of the major two political parties. Because if a third party is having a candidate out there running, who's either to the left or to the of the Democrats or to the right of the Republicans, then one argues that those, those candidates are quote unquote stealing votes. They're taking votes, whether it's a Green Party candidate or a Libertarian candidate. You know, those votes could be going to the main two political parties. So the political parties and their leadership, they want to do everything they can to undercut those third parties. And they do that by adopting some of their messages into their platforms. And that will prevent that vote, quote unquote, stealing that occurs. We talked about the Ralph Nader situation in 2000 in Florida in particular in class. We also talked about Ross Perot in 1992 and the huge impact he potentially had on that presidential election. Moving on to flashcard 12, talking about interest groups. You know, certainly when we talk about interest groups, we're talking about many, many different uh, groups. You know, there's not one group that does one thing or just a couple of different ones. So it's hard to really kind of narrow it down. However, you know, one could argue that uh, interest groups, they do inform voters. They'll do public messaging campaigns. They'll try to um, organize um, voters to uh, apply um, uh, pressure on uh, their, 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 uh, their congressmen whether it's by um, trying to get them to, uh, you know, write letters, letter writing campaign, you know, campaign contributions, you know, that sort of thing. Um, they'll certainly also educate office holders and they can be involved in the legislative process. You know, uh, people who write health care laws, which are very complex, they're going to need to get people involved in the healthcare industry in the consultation process, whether it's in committee hearings um, or, or other meetings, you know, they need to have experts in the field. And certainly these, uh, these interest groups can help do that. And they play a big role in the Iron Triangle. Um, the Iron Triangle, Flashcard 13, we've talked about it before. It's this relationship between an interest group and then you have a uh, congressional committee um, uh, and then you have a bureaucratic agency. OK, so these three, they have this kind of, you know, relationship with the interest groups lobbying uh, Congress, uh, the interest groups also working directly with the bureaucratic agency. The bureaucratic agency is trying to apply regulations that are favorable to different interest groups. They're trying to get funding from Congress. And we've diagrammed that. And, and it's important to go back in our unit on the bureaucracy and make sure you, you kind of are familiar with that, that triangular relationship between those three entities. Um, <clears throat> flashcard 14 talks about how, you know, it's, it's just kind of uh, obvious that some interest groups are able to have more money and political power than others, depending on how widespread their appeal is, depending on, um, uh, the nature of the, you know, if they're an oil industry, there's a lot of money in oil, right? So, uh, they certainly have access that, uh, you know, other people might not, they might have access to decision makers in Congress because of campaign finance reform. They might get people from their interest groups appointed to, um, government agencies. Okay. So, you know, is, is it, uh, is it the case that someone who is, uh, running a big business in, uh, agriculture, then all of a sudden become secretary of agriculture, right? So they have access there. Uh, many interest groups struggle with the free rider problem, right? People benefit from the activities of the interest group, the environmentalist groups, for example, we all want clean water, clean air, and we benefit from their activism, but maybe people aren't paying uh, or, or or joining membership of these groups, and they're just kind of free riding without without contributing. So that's something that people view as a problem in uh, in our democratic society sometimes. And then uh, our last topic here, sorry, uh, is uh, the media. The so media is a linkage institution, but it's very much changing, right? So I have to discuss the evolution of traditional news media, new tech, and social media as it relates to citizens' access to information. Uh, there can be no doubt that the uh, citizenry of the United States are consuming less traditional media, which would be things like newspaper or uh, mainstream television news on like a, a, a national network like ABC or CBS. Uh, and instead, they are consuming uh, social media or they are consuming media that is being conveyed to them from other sources, perhaps by algorithms. Um, and that's a really evolving thing that campaigns are trying to deal with. And now we have here in 2021 this whole discussion of what is fake news, what is credible. And the Trump administration spent a lot of time attacking the mainstream media, saying they're no longer credible. They're controlled by, he would say, liberals who are out to get him. So, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a, an evolving landscape. And, you know, I don't think there's a single answer to uh, what's changing in the media. And we're all experiencing it. We're all seeing it. 
understanding conceptually what horse race journalism, though, is that that's something important. We see this all the time, um, especially coming out of a presidential election season. You know, that's when the coverage is on the polls more than it is on the policy. And, you know, who's winning and who's losing on any given day and who has momentum. And sometimes the, sometimes the press focuses so much on that that the actual policy issues can get a little lost because they're focusing on the horse race more than anything else. Uh, flashcard 16 debate over media bias I mean listen we talked about it in the canvas studio videos and we talk about it all the time uh, people say that that media institutions all have their own agenda and you know it makes it hard for a voter to really kind of get at the truth and you know that's that's just a reality depending on what you read what news sources you're watching um, and the president's uh, and the congressman's job is to kind of try to cut through that um, and that's I think an enormous challenge so if we go to Flashcard 17, how is the nature of debate in America impacted by increased media choices, right? So, you know, certainly we now have media that can cater to people's specific political views. And so this could be increasing political polarization, ideologically oriented programming goes along with this, right? Which is people who are conservative will watch, will watch and read conservative media. People who are liberal will watch and read liberal media. And they'll just have this, this kind of confirmation of their beliefs and they'll be reinforced and re-entrenched. And so without a, a viewing the, you know, the viewpoints of the other side, um, people are less likely to find a middle ground. You also have the idea, well, well, I basically talked about that, you know, and the media outlets are doing this because it's a predictable market. They know is going to uh, agree with their point of view and they're going to watch their advertisements. And, and that's something that's uh, happening more and more is that people are um, in, in, in the interest of making money. They're trying to promote specific view boys, viewpoints to um, get that uh, get that particular market. Um, and we're dealing with the uncertainty over the credibility of news sources. You know, we're all dealing with that, which is. Um, what's credible, what's not, what's real, what's fake, um, what's reliable. And, you know, in 2021, in this age when there's conspiracy theorists on the web and um, misinformation out there, I think we've seen the consequences of um, uncertainty about what's truth, um, even when it comes to, you know, uh, election results. So, you know, listen. I don't have all the answers to these things. The whole country is dealing with it and trying to figure it out. But it's certainly worth our time to think about, to process, um, and to try to develop our own opinions. And also make sure we're open-minded about different types of media sources we can be consuming so that we can get as complete a picture as possible. So anyway, this was a short, super-fast, rapid-fire review. Hope it was helpful. Have a great day.